Well, good morning again, everyone. I invite you to open up your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Uh, there's Bibles on the pew racks in front of you. Uh, if you don't have one with you, that's okay. Uh, I'll be reading everything out loud, so you're not going to miss anything. But in just a moment, we'll be taking a look at Matthew 28. A long time ago, in a faraway land, 11 men lost their fear of death. And they lost it seemingly overnight. And the world changed. Wouldn't it be great if you could lose your fears? Wouldn't that change your world? What are the kind of things that we are afraid of? We are afraid of, well, being alone. We are afraid of pain. We're afraid of uh, job situations. We're afraid of relationships that are broken. We can be afraid of being ostracized. We can be afraid of having people turn their backs on us. We can be afraid of the silent treatment. We never really get out of middle school, do we? There's lots of things that we can be afraid of, and often we are afraid of these things. But I'm telling you, a long time ago in a faraway land, 11 men lost their fear of everything, up to and including death. And God used that to change the world. Sounds like that could change our world too, doesn't it? Well, let's investigate further, shall we? So Matthew chapter 28, I'll begin at the very first uh, verse. Now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So what we've just read, the Easter story, uh, is from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew was one of the 12 disciples that Jesus called to walk alongside him. Matthew is a pretty interesting individual. Matthew was a tax collector, which meant he worked directly for the Roman government. The Romans were an occupying force in the land, which means the people hated them, and they hated anyone who would work with them, guys like Matthew. But Matthew had stumbled upon this man named Jesus and his world had changed. And Jesus had called Matthew to follow him and to be his disciple. And so Matthew did just that. And Matthew is an eyewitness to many of the events that occur in the gospel that he set down. And the things he didn't particularly eyewitness himself, he knew the people that, that were witnesses there. And so this is the account that we're reading from this morning. So go back to verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Now, whose tomb is this? What's going on? Well, as I mentioned before, Matthew was called to follow a man by the name of Jesus. He was a rabbi and a teacher, uh, but he also was different. In fact, he would tell them that he was different. 
He was the son of man, which is a prophetic saying going back to the Old Testament book of Daniel, the very one to whom God himself would give dominion over all things. He was the Messiah. He was the King of Kings. He was the very son of God as he is the son of man. God made flesh. And Matthew, realizing this, followed him. And others did as well. The other 11 disciples and many others. And they followed him as he ministered in a region called Galilee. And then he set his sights on Jerusalem, heading towards the capital city, the city where the temple lay. He headed there for the Passover feast, a feast that uh, remembered what God had done with the people long ago, where there had been a Passover lamb and this lamb, uh, its blood would be put on the doorposts and lentils of their homes and there uh, they would be uh, saved from their sins. Uh, uh, the, 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 the judgment of God would pass over their house. Well, this is what they were going to commemorate. Jesus leads his disciples up there. Uh, he has a Passover meal with them. And at that meal, he changes the Passover feast to be what we refer to now as communion, stating that he himself had come to be the perfect Passover lamb, a human living a perfect life who could then be a substitute for the sins of other people. Matthew was a part of this. The, 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 the Passover feast went. They headed out to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And it was then that everything fell apart. Jesus was arrested by the religious authorities who then turned him over to the political authorities, the state. And from there he was scourged, beaten, nailed to a Roman cross, their means of execution, and put to death. And he died on Friday. Saturday was a fog for Matthew and the other disciples. But then Sunday came. Sunday, a number of women who had followed Jesus along with the disciples, they come to the tomb, were given their names, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Now, if you're there in Matthew 28, flip back to Matthew 27, picking up with verse 55. Here we get an indication of who these women are that show up at the tomb, because they're at the cross when Jesus is being crucified. So there in Matthew 27, verse 55, at the foot of the cross, there were also many women there looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. So there were these women who were there because they had come with Jesus from Galilee. They were followers too. They were there at the crucifixion, and now they are there at the tomb. And most of them were named Mary. Now, as it turns out, Scholars have researched this and found that 21% of women living in first century Palestine were in fact named Mary. That's one out of five, okay? You know how you go to the supermarket and you're going through the checkout aisle and they've got all the magazines that are there, People Magazine, you know, all these kind of things. They also have those little books you can buy, books of baby names. Have you seen those before in the checkout aisles? Well, today we have many choices. There's multiple books. I'm thinking back then when they went to the checkout aisle, there was only one book. And it said the name you want to name your daughter is in fact Mary. Well, sure enough, there's a number of women there. They tend to be named Mary. Now, you note who isn't there on Sunday morning. Well, Matthew's not there. The other disciples, the men, they're not there. Now, why aren't they there? It's because they were afraid. On the night Jesus was betrayed, that Thursday night, he takes them to the garden right outside the, the city gates there, the Garden of Gethsemane, where there's olive groves. And he goes there to pray. And he brings his disciples with them. Uh, but they all fall asleep. 
And then the religious authorities show up coming to arrest Jesus. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. And they arrest Jesus. And you know what happens to Matthew and James and John and Peter and these strong guys that have been following Jesus? They flee for their lives. They skedaddle. They're scared to death. Uh, the authorities are coming down on Jesus. He is going to be arrested. They can see now what's going to happen. They're afraid the same thing is going to happen to them. They too will be arrested. They too will be beaten. They too will be turned over to be executed. And so they run for their lives. They run for their lives. And they've spent the last 36 hours or so cowering. Now, there were a few that crept uh, in to see what was happening to Jesus. We know Peter did this a little bit. We know John does this a little bit. Uh, but they're hanging back. They are still very much afraid. So when Sunday morning rolls around, they are not at the tomb. But the women are. The women have come. They're not quite sure why they're there, except that they just want to be there because their Lord that they loved had been killed. They hoped perhaps that someone could be there to roll the stone away from the tomb and they could anoint his body afresh with, with, um, with, with oils and, and perfumes just to do honor to him. But that's really it. They don't really know what else they can do, but they desire to be there. Now, one more thing I'll mention about the women, besides the fact that they show up when the men don't, is this. At that time, women were not allowed to be witnesses at a trial. Women couldn't hold that position. Now, if I have triggered any of you, I am very sorry. This was just the truth of the situation. And I explained that to you this morning to note this. The women are going to be the very first witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. And God arranged this. God doesn't care that they weren't allowed to be witnesses. He's going to make them witnesses anyway. Uh, and it also speaks to the authenticity of these events. If this was a fiction that was being written down by Matthew, I can tell you he wouldn't have the women being the first witnesses of this event because they weren't officially legal witnesses. But they were. God chose. So they're there at the tomb. Okay, verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. Let me talk about first century tombs with you for a minute. Uh, they uh, would often bury their family in tombs that were cut into uh, the stone, a cave basically with an entrance. Uh, this, we are told, is a new tomb. Uh, often their tombs would have had multiple chambers for past generations and then an antechamber up in the front where the deceased would be uh, laid uh, initially. This tomb apparently didn't have that. It just had that first chamber because it was newly cut. It was a rich man's tomb. His name was Joseph of Arimathea. He was a rich man who had become a tentative disciple of Jesus. But when Jesus died, he decided to turn over his tomb for Jesus to be buried in. Uh, we know it's a rich man's tomb because it had a movable stone. The way the tombs would have been done uh, for someone who wasn't wealthy, they would have had a stone that would have blocked the entrance and it would have been something like a cork in a bottle. It would have just been sort of wedged in there. It would have taken some effort to get it back out again when someone new needed to be buried. For a rich individual, there was a stone that was round that could be rolled and the stone would be on a slight elevation. So it would have a place it could rest here. And then when it was time to close the tomb, two or three men could push it over the stopper and it would roll into place and there it would sit. These stones would be about four and a half feet high, not particularly high. Uh, the entrance that they closed would be something like three feet high. And we know this was the case in the tomb that Jesus was buried in because in, in two of the other gospels, we see that both Peter and John, when they run to the tomb to investigate what has happened, they stoop down to look in. So they, they are looking into one of these tombs. Once again, another little detail that speaks to the authenticity of these accounts. And so an angel comes. 
The stone is rolled back. The angel sits on the stone. His appearance was like lightning. Uh, His clothing was white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Now, in reading this account, there are two individuals or groups that are at this tomb that we don't normally see at tombs. One would be that angel. Okay, we see lots of statues of angels in old cemeteries, but to see a real live uh, angel would be out of the ordinary, let's just say. The other thing that would be out of the ordinary would be to see a guard in front of a tomb, soldiers in front of a tomb. Who's afraid that the dead are gonna get up and walk away? Nobody because they're dead. But there's a guard here. Now, why is the guard here? Let's ask that question first. Well, you've got your Bibles open there, Matthew 28. Look at the very last few verses of Matthew 27. I pick up with verse 62. The next day, this is Saturday, that is the day after the day of preparation, the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, We remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. So Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. So the day before, the day after Jesus is put in the tomb, the religious authorities gather together and they remember something that the disciples have forgotten. Uh, And that is that Jesus on multiple occasions stated that he would be put to death, but would rise again on the third day. Uh, It's funny that the disciples, that this seemed to go in one ear and out the other. They just didn't register with them. They didn't understand it. They were confused by it. But the religious authorities, they heard it. And here's why I suspect that they heard it. They heard it because, in point of fact, they actually wanted to put him to death. They wanted to take Jesus, put him to death, bury him in a tomb, and forget about him. And here he's saying, oh, you can try it, but it's not going to work. They would, that would have caught their attention. That would have caught their attention. And in fact, it, it, it did catch their attention because Jesus did say these things. And so they want to make sure that no one pulls a fast one in the middle of the night and removes Jesus's body and claims that he has risen again something they know to be impossible. We all know it to be impossible. The dead can't come back to life, but they didn't want a fraud to be perpetrated here. And so they go to the Roman governor. They themselves don't have the authority to do much, but the Roman governor does. His name is Pilate. Pilate stood in place there in Palestine of the Roman emperor back in Rome. The Roman Empire was perhaps the most powerful empire and therefore the most powerful state that has ever existed on this planet. And its representative in Palestine at this time was the governor, Pilate. And so they go to Pilate. They tell him their problem. And Pilate says, you have a guard, the guard of Roman soldiers put uh, at their disposal. Take the guard, make the tomb as secure as you can. And so they seal it with wax. Remember there's that round stone that rolls in front of the entrance of a tomb. They either put the wax around and onto that stone and then put the seal of Rome in the wax as it was drying, or they took cords and tied the stone fast to its spot and sealed the cords up against the rock with melted wax and put the seal in there. So anyone would know if that seal had been broken. You know, that was a a good security device. And in order to ensure that no one even got that close, 
they put Roman soldiers on either side of that stone to guard it. The Roman soldiers were the very emblem of the power of Rome, which made it the most powerful empire the world had ever seen up to that point, and some would say even to today. The Roman soldiers were there. And then we have the angel that shows up, okay? And when the angel shows up, the Roman soldiers fall down as if dead. What we're seeing here is a conflict of empires. The first empire is the Roman Empire, the empire that was the strongest of any that this world has ever seen, an empire that has dominated this dark and sinful world through the sword, through the spear. That's one empire. But then we have another empire that has showed up at the tomb as well, and that's the kingdom of heaven representing Almighty God and representing the King that has come from heaven, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And who wins this battle? Well, Jesus is risen, as the angel has said, and the soldiers of Rome fall as if dead. Okay? It, it's not really that hazy at this point, is it? The greatest empire this world has ever known was impotent to keep a dead man in his tomb. But the power that raised this dead man, that's the one that we need to learn more about, isn't it? That's the one that we need to learn more about. So the angel's there. He sits on the stone. Verse 5. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. See, I have told you. And you know what Jesus told them uh, before as well? Uh, you don't have to flip here, but I'm going to flip to Matthew 20. This is one of the last things that Jesus did before he arrived in Jerusalem for that Passover feast. This is Matthew 20, verse 17. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside. And on the way, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And he will be raised on the third day. So this is one of a number of instances where Jesus does share what is going to happen before it happens. But that kind of begs a question, doesn't it? So if we have this conflict of empires where we have the Roman Empire, the greatest the world's ever seen, uh, falling dead uh, uh, or like dead at the tomb, and we have an angel from the kingdom of heaven coming and displaying the power of heaven over these events, if all of that is the case, and if the kingdom of heaven is so powerful, and if God is large and in charge, why did he not prevent his son his anointed one, Jesus the Messiah, from dying in the first place. If I can do everything, why couldn't God do that? Was God uh, impotent at, at the hands of the chief priest and, and the Pharisees who, who condemned Jesus in a trial? Was God uh, under the power of the Roman governor who sent Jesus off to be flogged and nailed to the Roman form of execution, a cross? Was God beholden to these temporal earthly powers? Well, of course not. Uh, what about the crowd, the crowd that was with Jesus on Palm Sunday that but deserted him during the week? Uh, was, was God powerless in the face of that crowd? No, no, of course not. Jesus went to the cross, not because he was betrayed by Judas, not because the religious authorities uh, wanted him out of the way, not because Rome wanted him out of the way. 
He went to the cross because this was the reason he came in the first place. Scripture tells us this incredible truth that we, we struggle to wrap our minds around, and that is that Jesus, though fully human, was also fully divine, fully God. He was God in the flesh, the Son of God to the Father in heaven. Because of this, he had the ability to live a human life, but a human life that conquered the enemies that we fall prey to, the enemies like temptation and sin and doing the things that we know are wrong, but they're fun anyway, and, and not doing the things we, we know are right and, and sometimes try to do but fail at repeatedly. All of those things that we can't do, Jesus was able to do. He resisted temptation. He lived a perfect life, therefore becoming a perfect substitute for us when it was time for judgment to fall. All throughout the centuries, God had called on people to confess their sins before him and to be uh, forgiven of those sins temporarily by doing ritual acts, by taking innocent animals and symbolically placing their misdeeds on those animals and then having those animals sacrificed, slaughtered in their place. And God would accept that temporarily as, as a fix for the problem of sin. But it had to be do, done repeatedly over and over again because the sins would accumulate repeatedly over and over again. A perfect sacrifice was necessary. And Jesus, by living a perfect life, not sinning, turning away from temptation, fully following the will of his Father in heaven throughout his life, became that perfect sacrifice. And so he went to the cross, was nailed to the cross. And while he hung there, he took your misdeeds and my misdeeds, the misdeeds of the women, the misdeeds of the disciples, all of our sins, and they died there on that cross with him. God accepted this as the perfect sacrifice and Jesus was raised again on the third day. Once again, a victory, a resounding victory of the kingdom of heaven over the kingdom of this earth, not just political forces, but our own worst enemies, ourselves, our sin, and even the death that is the punishment for our sin. All of our enemies overcome by Jesus on the cross and now the empty tomb. So this is why Jesus went to the cross. It was God's purpose that he go. And once again, we see his victory becoming even more complete. Uh, one of the reasons that the religious authorities were, were so afraid of Jesus was that before Jesus went to the cross, he was going around forgiving people of their sins. He was doing this knowing that he would offer himself up as this perfect sacrifice. Well, the religious authorities, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, all that, they held control of the apparatus of the forgiveness of sins in that world. And so Jesus was in the business of putting them out of business. And they feared this. And so they wanted him to be condemned. They wanted to, well, bury him in the tomb and bury any kind of truth about him in the tomb. But that wasn't going to happen, was it? Wasn't going to happen. The truth comes out as it always does. It breaks forth into glorious sunlight and they could no longer hide what was going on there. And we're going to see that in just a second. So the angel tells the ladies, now go quickly, verse 7, and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So the women are given the task of going and sharing what has just happened. 
uh, they desire and are given the charge by heaven to share what has happened. But look at what the religious authorities do. Jump down to verse 11, which we haven't looked at yet. Verse 11. Now, while they, the women, were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And the story has been spread among the Jews to this day. So Matthew's writing probably about 20 years after these events. And to this day, uh, in order to try to cover up this amazing thing that had happened, the religious authorities paid off the guards to keep silent. So look what heaven does. Heaven tells the women to go and share the truth, the good news. Look at what the religious authorities do. They pay hush money to the guards to try to bury the truth, to make it go away. Well, the fact that we are here today, 2,000 years later on a different continent, speaks to the fact that they were impotent in burying the truth, doesn't it? The truth has a way of coming out, does it not? And the truth did, in fact, come out. Uh, uh, on an earlier year at a different church when I was preaching, uh, preaching an Easter Sunday message, what I did in preparation before that was I uh, got on the internet and I looked for Bible-believing churches in every time zone of the planet and uh, got a little bit of information about them. And so I opened the sermon by uh, uh, calling everyone's attention to a church in uh, Christ Church, New Zealand, uh, that was gonna be, uh, that actually had already celebrated Easter because of the, the time difference. And I just went across the globe, each time zone, uh, highlighting a different church that was celebrating Easter just as we are. The truth cannot be buried, even though powerful people work to do it. Those powerful people were afraid of the truth. Now, we started this morning talking about being afraid. Are you afraid of the truth? Think about that for a minute. Uh, there's many other things that we can be afraid of, right? And we mentioned some of these. We can be afraid of uh, the drift that our society is taking. We can be afraid of disease and death. We can be afraid of being alone. But we can also be afraid of the truth. Because what happens when we drag the truth out into the bright light of heaven? Nothing can hide. Everything is exposed. Everything that we've done, everything we've thought, everything we've said, everything we've neglected to do or say, all of these things, when dragged into the light, are exposed. And that's a scary proposition, isn't it? That's a good thing to be afraid of, that everything about us would be revealed. There are people here this morning via the live stream in the room here that are afraid of, of just that. You are afraid that your incapacity to live the life you want to live without hurting people by, by accident or on purpose, without controlling your impulses, without uh, being able to watch what you say or do or feel or think, this inability would be exposed and you'd be seen for who you are, someone who needs help, needs divine intervention, in fact. Someone, frankly, just like the rest of us because we all need that. But it's a scary thing to contemplate. I think the religious leaders were afraid of similar things to this. They were afraid that if God ever did really shine his light on their lives, 
and the apparatus that they controlled, it wouldn't look very pretty. You ever feel like you're fooling everybody? That if they only knew, and you don't want them to know, right? This is what happens when the light shines and our fears are brought in front of us. If you are in that situation this morning, let me tell you that there is really no reason to fear. The idea that all of your inadequacies or failures or the darkness of your heart, the stuff that goes on when no one's around in your mind, that these things would not look very pretty when they come to light and therefore they need to not come to light. Well, my friends, the truth cannot be buried forever. Maybe for a season, maybe for Saturday, but Sunday does come. And at some point in this life, be it on this side of eternity or the other side, we will stand in the presence of the righteous judge and the light will be on us and everything will be exposed. That is a scary proposition because there's no way to hide there. And oftentimes we're not even able to hide in this life even though we try. But Jesus who has conquered sin and death, if we cast ourselves upon his mercy He shares with us his victory. The victory he won by defeating death, the victory he won by defeating sin. And when we stand before the righteous judge, we don't stand alone. He stands beside us and says, this one is mine. I have redeemed him. I have redeemed her through my blood. She is clean. He is righteous. We don't need to fear the light of justice and truth and righteousness. And therefore, we don't need to fear anything else. We don't need to fear death. Think of Jesus' disciples that ran, okay? Uh, Why did they run? They were afraid of being arrested, just like Jesus. They were afraid of being mistreated. They were afraid afraid of being accused, condemned, tortured, and killed. Those are legitimate fears. They were his followers. If he's going to be condemned to death, it would make sense that the state would condemn them as well. Legitimate fears, right? If we're in the same situation, that would be a lot for us to fear also. Uh, Think about the women. They weren't afraid of that. They were not going to be tried as his followers. Uh, But they were afraid probably of other things, maybe even deeper fears. Here's what the women would have been afraid of. They would have been afraid that this man who had given them such hope, who had forgiven them, who had treated them with respect, who had given them a sense of purpose and really hope to continue in this life, they were afraid that it was all over. He was dead. He was in the tomb. And if they dug a little bit deeper, there would have been the fear that maybe it was all an illusion all along. That this guy, even though he spoke pretty and acted nobly, was really just a guy like everybody else and his time had come. There was a real fear that their hope was a mirage and it was gone. Well, when Jesus walks out of the tomb, when he greets the women and they fall at his feet and worship him, clutching his feet with the scars of the nails still in them, that fear starts to leave. It was not a mistake. It's not a mirage. Jesus is the king and he has conquered. Look at what he says to the women. 
Verse 9, And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. He says two things to them. First, do not be afraid. Second, go and tell uh, my brothers to meet me in Galilee. So this is now the second time they've been told to go and tell. What did the religious authorities say to the guards? Hush it up. Bury the truth. That's not what heaven says. Heaven says, go and tell. Go and tell the good news that the greatest thing that has ever happened has indeed happened. And we no longer have to be afraid of anything, of anything. And that's the first thing Jesus says to them. Do not be afraid. The disciples, the 11 of them, you know, Judas uh, uh, betrayed Jesus and so he's gone. But the 11 of them, they overcome their fear of everything pretty much overnight. And God uses them to change the world. Now, it's not, it's not these 11 guys that changed the world. It was God who changed the world by coming and dying and rising again. But he used the 11 to change the world. But it's, it's not quite as simple as that because it wasn't just 11, right? It was the 11 plus all the Marys, okay? Uh, and it was the 11 plus all the Marys up to the tune of about 500 individuals. Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that Jesus, after his death and uh, his resurrection, after his resurrection rather, he appeared to 500 brothers and sisters disciples, followers of Christ. And when Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, he says many of these, excuse me, many of these individuals are still alive. Reach out to them. Hear their stories. This really happened. The chief priest in Rome, they couldn't bury it. It's out there. It really happened. And the women and the men over the course of the next few days, their shock turns to awe. Then it turns to determination, to not abandon Jesus again. And he gives them a command to go and tell all the nations as he ascends up into heaven. And then, about 40 days out, the Spirit falls on them at Pentecost. And now... Their fear of everything is gone. Are you afraid? What are you afraid of? You afraid of death? Afraid of being alone? Afraid of being ostracized? Afraid of people turning their back on you? Afraid of the direction you think things are going? Afraid of pain? All of these are things that we can be afraid of. But in light of the fact that Jesus has conquered sin and death and is alive, I ask you again, what are you afraid of? And if you are afraid of anything, why are you afraid? There is no reason. Now we're human beings and, and fear is going to surprise us from time to time. There's no doubt about that. But upon reflection, what do we have to fear? We don't have to fear the judgment of a righteous God because Jesus will stand next to us. We don't have to fear death because Jesus will welcome us on the other side. We don't have to fear being alone because we can never be alone when we belong to Jesus. We don't have to fear people turning their backs on us because once again, Jesus, there's nothing that we have to fear. Unless, of course, we fear having our lives pushed out into the light of heaven. Now that's a real fear. 
Now, as I mentioned before, that's a fear that doesn't have to keep driving us. Jesus offers his salvation freely to all who would call on his name. Think of the thief on the cross dying next to Jesus, crying out in that moment, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus' response to him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. All of us need the help of God. We don't need to fear admitting that. And we don't need to fear the things that have a hold on our lives. We may be afraid to turn our lives over to God because we're afraid of letting go of that thing we're pretty sure he's gonna want us to let go of. It's precious to us, but we don't even need to fear that. Step into the light of heaven. Call on the name of the risen Lord and be saved. Pray with me. Almighty God, we praise you and thank you for what you have done. You have sent your son, yourself, God in the flesh, to take our punishment for us. And having taken our punishment, rising again, gifting us, if we ask, with forgiveness and new life, eternal life in you. Dear Lord, I pray for those here this morning that are afraid of the light of heaven shining on their lives. The rest of us have been there. Dear Lord, I pray that through the power of your spirit, you would overcome that fear and you would have them this morning call out to you, Jesus, help me with my fear. Forgive me, make me yours. And I pray, dear Lord, that that happens in their hearts. The miracle of the resurrection happening again today as it is happening all over the world. Dear Lord, for those of us who have followed you for some time, uh, who still deal with fear from time to time and perhaps are dealing with a particular fear right now, Lord, I pray, Lord, that through the power of your spirit, you would remove the blinders that we keep wanting to put in front of our eyes and remind us that truly we have nothing to be afraid of. You are Lord and you are risen from the dead and you stand beside us, ushering us into the presence of the Father in heaven. Of what do we need to be afraid? Dear Lord, help us as we wrestle with our fears today and in days to come when they surprise us. But we thank you for what you have done and how you have done it. We thank you for Jesus. It is in his name that we pray. Amen.